Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Robert Jordan. Robert is the CEO of Interim Execs, a company that matches top executives with companies around the world. He is the author of Right Leader, Right Time, Discover Your Leadership Style for a Winning Career and Company. In this book, Robert identifies four unique leadership styles that when applied to the right role at the right time will skyrocket success for both the leader and the organization. I am excited to have him on the show to talk about these styles and how they work. So, Robert, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, John. It's a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, it's great to meet you. And we had a great talk before we started the show. Uh, But I want to give you an opportunity to tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your company, Interim Execs. What do you do? Like, And how did you come about starting that company? I run a company called Interim Execs, as you said. It's a global matchmaker between organizations that have some leadership need and uh, a a team, we call it RED team. RED stands for Rapid Executive Deployment, which is uh, an exceptional group of executives around the world. And that was formed based on lots of years of, of, uh, well, it's about 7,000 executives who showed up on our proverbial doorstep, if you will. We developed ranking and scoring and screening and about nine years ago launched the concept of Red Team. Yeah, I saw that. And so essentially what it is, is if if a company is in need of an executive or in need of a staff or going through a big transition, you're going, they're going to call you and you can bring either one or two or a whole team in, right? Is that, is that the way I understand it? Yes, exactly. That's what it is. It sounds, you know, now it's easy for us. It, it's interesting that when we started this about 15, 16 years ago, it was impossible. I mean, mm-hmm. literally, I was asked prior to, to starting this, I'll, I'll give you a little formative history. I'm, I'm your classic entrepreneur. I've been in um, many different kinds of startups, some that I started, some where I helped other entrepreneurs, usually around technology, uh, massive amount of failure around that. Uh, luckily, over the years, I've been in three IPOs, and I I was the guy on the team who led um, a number of company sales where a strategic buyer uh, paid a high multiple um, to buy a smaller early stage company. But I've been an interim CEO before uh, we started interim execs. Um, I was an interim CEO for many years. When social networks came around, Facebook, MySpace, LinkedIn, I started wondering how many people around the world were like me with this weird job title. (laughs) And so initially we started a free search engine and thousands of executives from around the world showed up and it was another failure. As a business model, it was a total bust. It's interesting you say that. We've had multiple guests on the show that, you know, were entrepreneurs and they they almost all have have a, a story in their journey where they did something that failed. Uh, just, you know, from your, your experience, what was that like? And then did it help you in your next stage and the next things, next things that you did? Well, my, my first failure was the most noteworthy. Uh, I was in business school and I was at Northwestern and, and, uh, Northwestern University Kellogg was at the time ranked the top business school, uh, if not the world, the U.S., And I was kind of bored. And so I dropped out to go start the first magazine anywhere in the world that covered online and internet. I was only about five years too early, ran out of cash repeatedly. And so I launched at the age of 26. I had raised some money from wealthy investors. And within two years, uh, the company went bust. And there's no, there really is no experience like being a 28 year old thinking you're just going to be a failure forever and walking into federal bankruptcy court, Mm. downtown Chicago, to go file papers for bankruptcy because the whole staff has been laid off and there's nobody else to go do this. And I was the founder. That was a unique moment. Mm. Yeah, that's a unique moment that no one is an entrepreneur. I mean, I'm an entrepreneur. I've been in it seven years. I, that's the my biggest fear is that doing something, you know, making it, you know, making a bad decision or or you know getting too stretched out with cash or what have you that that I would ever end up in that situation. I imagine it's the biggest fear for any entrepreneur. Easily, the the funny thing is, 
So, so I, I had a pity party for myself for about a week. Only one person was invited. And, <laughs> and then I kind of realized, wait a minute, we had all these assets. We, we had major advertisers. We had sold thousands of subscriptions. We had one of the highest sell-through rates on newsstands of any magazine. I thought all these assets. And so I ended up buying the rights back out of bankruptcy court, starting again, and eventually uh, got on the, the, the magazine, the business put me on the Inc. 500 list for fastest growing businesses. So I went from can't do anything right to I couldn't do anything wrong <laughs> um, at some point. But it was interesting that, that after, so I did the magazine for 10 years and then sold it to a big publisher. Along the way, I was helping a lot of other entrepreneurs. Then when I became an interim executive, I was working with a lot of company founders. And in some cases, you know, where a business is desperate and it might have to go through a reorganization or there was a fight among investors, I could see this utter fear on the face of the entrepreneur, the founder. And I realized that it was like, oh my God, I, I hated what I had to go through, but I actually see the benefit of it, which is, it's like, well, you're, you're a military guy. I was at war. I went into battle. I was shot at and I survived. Right. right. And it's, it's kind of an irreplaceable experience that someone who hasn't been under fire does not understand at all. Yes. And, and so I, I've always kind of resisted it, but I realized I'm a far better, um, more responsible leader having gone through it. I never would wish it on anybody, but it happened. And it seasoned me in a way nothing else would. Yeah, yeah. And that's a great, that's a great, uh, it's a great lesson in terms of failure is a great, you know, it's a great leadership tool, right? You learn from it, you learn what not to do, you learn from your mistakes. But it's also, you know, once you've gone through, gone through that rough patch or that you've, you've, you've you survived it, and I think it makes you more resilient to, uh, you know, and you it, it makes you appreciate when when times are good, right? And it makes you more resilient when things get bad. You're like, well, it's not as bad as back then. That that high water mark that you had for a for a rough period. So I always think the tough times are good for us because I think it helps us in in the good times and it helps us when things get a little rough. You're like, like for me, I've never had a as as rough an experience as I did uh, on a submarine at sea in the North Atlantic in the middle of a winter storm. Not, nothing is as bad as that. Life is so much easier than that. So so for me, that was my high water mark. And I figured if I get through that, I can get through anything. So I think once you've had those experiences, it makes you more resilient for the future. And it just just in my personal experience. You're you're 100 percent right. And and you have the talk about a high water mark. Yes, serving on a sub. Um, you know, one of my sage mentors over the years, he he quoted Benjamin Franklin. He said, experience keeps a dear school, but a fool will learn in no other. And I thought, mm. well, okay, <laughs> that was my badge as the fool. Right, right. Yes, absolutely. Well, um, let's talk a little bit. You've got you've got a new book out and I want to talk about it. It's called Right Leader, Right Time. And uh, in there, you've got these four leadership styles. And before we get into that, I want to just ask you, do a lot of a lot of the um, uh, experiences that you have working with uh, bringing in interim executives, working with companies that are going through transition or needing 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 support, um, were a lot of the styles that you talk about in this book, was it based on observations that you've seen over the past you know, decade or so uh, in this role? Right, exactly. It, it, um, the, the impetus for doing the book was both the, when you, when you have a chance to interact, you know, 7,000 people showing up is a lot. It, it's, yeah. I don't know that it approaches science in the data sense, but boy, it's a lot of anecdotal. And we saw these two patterns. The first pattern was not a good one. It was that the majority of these executives showing up, this is from 50 countries, over a 10 year span, the majority of executives were experiencing careers and leadership journeys that were not remarkable. Mm. Mediocre really would be a way to describe it. And that was disturbing. The converse of that was when we looked at the top two, three percent, remarkable leaders having exceptional career journeys. And we saw these four distinct 
leadership styles that that was their way of expressing their abilities. That's why we had to write about it. The, the painful side was an equal motivator though, because in particular, trying to get a message out to younger people earlier on in their career journeys and in leadership to give some cautionary advice. And to boil it down, I would say, do not try to be all things to all people. Hmm. Because while that sounds very obvious, and you could even point this out to a lot of the leaders where their experience is just kind of okay, they would deny it, but the results don't bear out. Hmm. The flip side is that for exceptional leaders, the further they go in, in their career and their leadership journey, they keep on refining and refining. They get to a point, we use this phrase in the book, highest and best use. Mm -hmm. And exceptional leaders over time tend to reject more of what is not for their highest and best use. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm 55. I've been doing this for three decades. I've been a leader for three decades. And I think I, I would just tend to agree with you. Like there's, you know, I, I, you know, you've, you've seen a lot, you've experienced a lot. So you sort of say, that's, that's not helpful for where I'm headed, you know, and you can say no more than you say yes. And actually, that's a kind of a fun place to be. So I think when you're younger, you, you're like, yes, you know, show me, okay, that looks good. You're, you're chasing rabbits where you don't really know your true style yet. You don't know um, where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are. And I think the older you get, or the more time you have, the more experience you have, the more you realize exactly what you need and where your weak spots are. And, and you, you focus only on that. And it, it's, it's your less chest chasing rabbits, but you're, you've got, you've got a guiding light, a guiding principle now. And I think that's where I am at is I've got I, I know what I want out of life and I know what my mission is and that's clear. Anything that distracts me from that mission is not helpful, you know, and I like that part. I like, I, for, for me at least, it's nice to be in that area where, I, where I'm not chasing rabbits anymore. So for sure. It's, yes, your, your, your journey is, is, the, is the exact example because it's the chasing rabbits when you're young and it's also when you're young, you need the job, you need the money. Mm -hmm. You know, and this idea of, oh, being so highly selective or whatever, good luck. Yeah. But this is something that grows and builds over time as your confidence grows. Mm -hmm. And and to be able to be more able to embrace who you are, which is very hard when you're young. And by the way, I would say it's harder now mm -hmm. because it's a much more distracted world. And so... Uh, not that it was easy. I mean, in, in anybody's career at any time, not easy when you're young, but but now the same or more challenge exists. Yeah, I think you're right. Absolutely, see distraction as a problem. That too many too many inputs. I think at, at, at this at this point uh, for sure. So let's talk about these styles because what you say that they're unique leadership styles, but they're when they're applied, and this is what's important, I think, that, that, that I want to stress is that when you're applied to the right role at the right time, they're going to lead to skyrocketing success for the leader in the organization. So they're, they're styles that um, it's almost like a puzzle piece. They got to be put in the right spot to be able to be successful. So talk a little bit about those four styles and, and maybe some of the roles where they, where they fit. The four styles are fixer, artist, Builder and strategist, FABS. And in the book, we refer a lot to FABS leadership styles, or there's a survey tool coming out called FABS leadership assessment. Fixer, as the name implies, is the leader who is drawn to crisis. This is the person who loves running into the burning building. Now, here's the distinction because all good leaders exhibit all four of these leadership styles at various points, and they have to. We're not trying to pigeonhole someone to say, you can only be this one thing. That's not what we're saying. The fixer though, is drawn time after time to the burning building, as opposed to, for example, um, I am much more of the artist leader. And while I've encountered problems numberless times, you, you know, in my career, I'm not drawn to it. Mm. I have to solve problems, but that's not really where I'm getting my energy. Make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I would, I was, I, I would say I identify a bit with that because most of my career I was sent in to fix struggling manufacturing businesses. So I was sort of the fixer my most of my life. So 
So that I, is I identify that. You know, I bring yes. I bring chaos to order. Is that's what I've always done and grown businesses and fixed all the problems and kind of left it to somebody else after it was all fixed. And so I just kept doing that over and over again. That was sort of my role in corporate America for 22 years as a fixer. And and when you and when you solve that problem, you got this adrenaline rush, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was, it's a, a source, it was a sense, a source of pride for me to, to be able to, it was like a puzzle that needed to be solved and it was difficult and, it, you know, and, and it was about people and motivating people and changing people out, getting the right leadership team in place and sort of like a, a Rubik's cube trying to solve and all these things. And I loved it. I loved it. It was, it was just energetic to be able to take that chaos and bring order to it. And I love that part of it, the challenge of it. Sure. Yeah. And, I definitely and part of the energy that. you have uh, is that let's face it, there are not many people around you that can do that or yeah. in that company or in that division or in that situation, you're it. Mm. If it was easy, it already would have been done. Right. But, but for the rest of the team or the leadership, it was viewed as kind of impossible. Right. So, right. so they, they throw someone really talented at it the first time. And if that person can solve that problem, can fix it, they get that hook planted. Yeah, so this yeah. fixer energy has to keep doing it over and over. For One sure. of the prompts for the title fixer is that we had done a book about champion company founders before this book. It's called How They Did It. And one of the public company CEOs, out of the blue, he said, during one of the interviews, he said, you know, if I put a fixer into one of my companies and it isn't broken, he'll break it just so he can <laughs> fix it. And I thought, that's fascinating. It, I unfortunately I think I identify with a little bit of that because I do like a little bit of um like I have my own company, right? And we've got the thing kind of running like a top now. So there's nothing broken to fix. So I sort of, you know, it's it's interesting. So I do have some nervous energy, like there's nothing to fix. You know, what can I fix? <laughs> yes, yeah, you got it. Well, I, I'd have some thoughts on that, but uh so that that is fixer energy, um, fixer leadership style artist. Artist is the leader who views the world as a blank canvas or mm. as a piece of clay to be molded. Standout example in the world everyone knows is Elon Musk. Yeah. And I'm referring to Elon and mode of Tesla, SpaceX, boring company. I am not referring to, to <laughs> Elon. As you and I are recording this, John, Elon is in week five, I think it is, of owning yeah. Twitter. And he is showing absolutely how much he is not fixer energy as his as his uh, lead style. He has an ability to solve crisis. I know he's done it time after time, but he is primarily driven by innovation. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and, and solving things, things, yeah, solving things that no one's ever tried to solve. I mean, really big problems. I, you know, the boring company, you know, putting, you know, tunnels underneath major cities. I mean, so yeah, you're right. Blank canvas, that's definitely his, his style. Well, to, to his credit, he has, in some ways, he started single-handedly. He's changed two major arenas, industries in the world. Yeah. I mean, electric vehicles is where it is now at as an, a, a thing around the world, an impetus around the world because of Elon Musk. Let's yeah. face it. Yeah. You know, people thought he was crazy in the beginning. And the same thing is true of private space exploration. Everyone thought it's just it's the province of governments and NASA and everything else. He's completely upended that. Yeah. And by the way, for anybody out there that's got limited money as opposed to unlimited money, it's an interesting contrast between Elon Musk, SpaceX, and Jeff Bezos, because Jeff Bezos essentially, you know, could throw unlimited money, Amazon profits at his space venture. And he he's still not in orbit. Mm, for he sure. He achieved orbit yet. Yeah, for sure. I think. I don't think he's much of a he's he's a, he's a different kind of leader, but certainly not a blank uh, canvas kind of leader like like Elon is for sure. Yeah, well, well, I'm not. I don't even want to compare them him on on that. It's it's simply the idea that Elon did it, and and when he started SpaceX, he didn't he didn't have the resources he has now. No, for sure. Yeah, for sure. So that's artist. Um, artist is the renegade. Artist is the the outlier, the outsider, the person on your team that does not fit in well. One of the leaders we interviewed in the book was a lieutenant to Andy Grove. Andy Grove, arguably the best CEO Intel ever had. And Andy said of this 
this guy that he was his wild duck. He said, you have to have a wild duck on the team. And what he meant is you got all these brilliant engineers. You're all trying to work on the semiconductor, you know, solutions, cram more onto the chip, more onto the chip. And you had to have this outlier, this renegade who was throwing wrenches into things on purpose to get you to all think a little differently at points. I love that. The third leadership style is builder. Now I know everybody in business is, yes, I'm a builder. Mm. I get that. We mean something specific, which is the energy that takes the smaller or nascent product, service, client, team, and takes it to market domination. The mantra for builder is market. What tends to happen for veteran builders is when they get that product team company to scale, to market domination, you will see that person get bored. You will see them usually rotate off to do something else. Mm -hmm. You see it a lot among um, folks who hit IPOs and they just, they need to go back and do it all over again. Yeah, I definitely can see that as as uh, someone who's been through the journey, that um, there was a lot of fun and energy in that building stage to get it to a certain level. Now, and now it's, um, you know, uh, yeah, it's right. It's so there was so much maybe because it was, maybe because I'm a fixer, <laughs> it was so much chaos and we brought it into order and now it's kind of running smooth and it's like you know so you're right you, there's you lose a little bit of that adrenaline uh for the for the for that growth and uh you know kind of you're at a little more steady state and and uh, that you're right i definitely can see that and that's where you've got to get the right person now in that role to take it to the next level you know to to really grow it into you know so absolutely yep that makes a lot of and sense and so so that next level is the the remaining leadership style which is strategist yeah yeah we could have called strategist, conductor, pilot, quarterback. This is the leader at scale. This is the leader yeah. at an organization so complex um, or, or vast in size that for the leader, it has gone completely beyond personal span of control. Stephen Covey had this phrase in seven habits of your personal span of control. And it tends to be that leaders who are primarily wired as fixer artist or builder their team size is 10, it's 20, it's 50, it's 100, it's 200. Mm -hmm. But it typically is not a thousand people. Yep. It is something where there's a personal relationship with those people and they're going to drive for something that is incredible. Strategists cannot rely on all personal relationships to do what needs to be done in a vast organization. One of the strategist leaders we interviewed in the book, you'll be happy to know, John, the former undersecretary of the Navy, Janine Davidson. Oh, nice. And uh, it was very interesting that the language of each of these four styles is radically different. And to hear Janine describe how you could have impact in the Pentagon, how do you have impact? You know, you're at over a million people employed into an effort. And she talked about systems of systems. It's a level, it's a level of impact or abstraction that you just will not hear any similar similar language coming out of a fixer, or an artist, or a builder. Yeah, I definitely can. The strategist, the strategist I, is talking about loyalty, yeah. mentorship, cross training. Yeah, um, um, and and just tends to be kind of a vast amount of experience, usually at one organization. Totally different language for the other three styles. Absolutely, yeah. I definitely just I got a little taste of it in corporate life when I kind of moved up and and I had multiple plants underneath me and, and and the bigger I got, the more people I had reporting to me, the more I didn't like it. So it's interesting that I I clearly wasn't. I, I'm not a strategist. I mean, I like to be with a small team, you know, make getting something done. And and so I think you're right. You get to the point where you're. I clearly was like, this is I'm not comfortable in this role. I can't. I don't know all my employees' names and their families and their wife's names. And I don't know that anymore. And I don't like, you know, it's to me, it's a personal connection, like you said. And and a strategist is, it's about systems and processes and, and standardization. And it, that's not my that's not my bag of tea. It's interesting yeah. that. I can clearly just to be identify clear with all your listeners. We're not yeah. saying all, all great leaders have to do strategy. They're doing yeah. tactical and strategic right, things. Right. We're meaning a, a, a definition here for strategist that is, that is always at a point of scale. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, it's that we were. I said earlier, it's a puzzle piece that fits perfectly into that role of somebody that's taking, you know, a, that scale of a company, very large, that has that tendencies or those those skill sets that that fit perfectly in that spot. You put if you put an artist in that spot, it, it's not going to be a perfect fit, right? They have maybe some skills around that. But they don't. But they're not a perfect fit. A builder wouldn't have that perfect fit skill set. They might have some of those skills, but it's not a perfect puzzle piece fit. A strategist is like that perfect piece. You know, that Pentagon person. You know, that's a perfect. A million people. Right. I got it. You know, they they get energy from that. Where I didn't. I I did not like that. I didn't like no. going to the shop floor and not knowing my employees' names. I hated them. So interesting. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So for. Or, so, so John, for any anyone listening to this who's still skeptical, let me give you a, a a different example and see if it resonates for folks. You know, for about the past hundred years, medicine has become specialized. So, John, you and I are getting to know each other, and if you say I got this pain in my foot, well, if I know a really good podiatrist yeah. in town for you, Wake Forest, North Carolina, would say I got a great podiatrist for you. But I can guarantee you, John. I am not sending you over to an OBGYN. I'm not sending you to a <laughs> neurosurgeon. Right. I'm not sending you to a cardiologist. I'm sending you to a podiatrist. Right. right. So, so we as a society have accepted and now demanded that there are over 100 specializations in medicine. And look at the outcome for, for all of us. Longer health, just so much longevity, so much more happiness, relief of pain. It's a completely different society as a result, right? It's better. Hmm. Well, in business, we don't do that. Right. In business, we assume if one person in a role does something great, and especially if they amass any money, oh my God, they must be able to do just about anything. Yes. Not to go pick on Elon, but this is the example he is setting for all of us, which is none of us are all things to all people. And he ain't crushing it so far. Anyway, I'll stop picking on him. We yeah, all know but, of examples of people where it's like, yet. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think one of the things I sense in corporate is we tend to take puzzle pieces that don't quite fit perfectly, but we take a hammer and we, we slap them into place and we, we sort of make it work. And uh, I saw so many leaders fail because they were in they weren't in their sweet spot, right? And, and, and I didn't know this terminology back then, but I can clearly see that they were, they were you know, you know, like artists in a in a, a builder scenario, right? Where they weren't in the perfect fit for the, they weren't in the perfect role for their strengths, right? So, and I think when you, but if you using this uh, this framework, if you find the right skill set and you plug them into the right role of what's needed and it fits their strengths, that's when you're going to have this uh, uh, skyrocket, as you call it, the skyrocketing performance, and and for the leader they're in their sweet spot. They're in their comfort zone. They're in there. This is what I'm good at. And, uh, and like, I can tell you when I was plugged into fixing plants, I, that was me. I, that, I lived for that. I, I, I got my energy from it every day. We got better every day. I saw improvement every day. The scrap would go down and the productivity would go up and the shipments would go up and the customer satisfaction would go up. I'm like, this is great. This is nothing better than this than in my, my entire life was seeing the things turn around. So I was in that right role. I was the right person for the right role. So, and, and, and I clearly, when I got bigger, I felt a little bit out of, out of place when I was in the big organization with multiple plants and there wasn't as many problems. I wasn't like, I wasn't excited. So interesting, just reflecting on my journey, when you're in the wrong role, you definitely feel it, you sense it. Yes, and, and you know, the joy of, of being in that, that right position for yourself is incomparable. You're in a state of flow, right? Mm. You know, as, as the book says, and, and um, you know, we, we focus our uh, research and activity on business and, and leadership of business. But to be very clear here, that the forms of human genius are pretty much unlimited. Mm. And so, you know, one point, one of the uh, organizational psychologist we interviewed, he said, you know, Gallup has researched that 90% of leaders are in the wrong role. Oh, yes, I've read and, that. And I don't think the takeaway message should be to, to someone who, who is not crushing it, which is, oh my God, I'm never going to be successful. I think it's the understanding that, that the more you can embrace 
what is your highest and best use, the better off you are. And it's not, it, this does not mean it is in the leadership of a company. Mm. Now, one day I was reading, as, as we were doing the book, I was reading, I can't remember how I got into this. I have a little bit of a fear of heights. So I go onto a site and it's about, it's a how-to, how a skateboarder drops into a bowl. Mm. Okay, you know, skateboard parks. And you drop into one of these bowls and it's about a five foot drop, right? You can picture a skateboard park, okay? And they have these instructions from an expert, step-by-step. Step. How do you do this, right? You line the board up at the lip. You, you put all your weight on your back foot. When you get to step five or six, and your, your front foot, there's no weight on it, but it's at the front edge of the board. It's out over space, okay? You ever skateboarded, John? I mean, no, nothing like that, but yeah. Okay, I, was a I have kid. not. I was yeah. just vicariously getting a thrill out of this. Well, there's this moment where what you have to do is you have to commit 100% of you yeah. to going straight down. And basically it feels like your head is the first thing. You have to put all of your weight on your front foot. You have to go straight down 100%. And if you do that, you will land on your feet at the bottom of the bowl. But what, what this expert said for sure is if it's only 99% of you, if there's 1% holding back saying, I just don't want to crack my head at the bottom of this, the bottom of this bowl, you will fall. Yes. You will fall. Well, that kind of genius to be able to do that on a skateboard, that's what we're talking about in terms of this authentic you, if you are cut out for leadership which yeah. is 100% is of you going into this. Because what you described in your fixer mode, you're on, you're unstoppable. That's the thing we, we all need to do. And this is not a, a thing that is ever really static because one day you're on top of the world and everyone loves you and you're getting praise and the numbers are up and everything is great. And the next day, something went wrong and your your favorite person quit and and just and it didn't go right and so this is a continual kind of practice of 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 perfecting not arriving at perfect perfection but perfecting i love it i love it so i imagine in the book you're going to help uh the readers identify with where they fit in these four uh these four skill sets is that right I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Just I'll say in the book, you you actually will help, you're gonna help the readers help them find where they fit in this in, in these set of set of skills. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And and, and the first kind of discovery is simply it's it's exactly in a way like what you and I are going through, which is reading and learning. Mm, okay. Or listening and discovering uh more about yourself. The other thing we are doing is launching a free um tool and assessment. It's called Fab's Leadership Assessment. And so it's about three minutes and someone could take that and get a little, hopefully get some discovery out of that as well. That's fantastic. And when would that be out? Um, <laughs> I, I keep on saying to everyone, uh, a couple of days. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure by the time your listeners are listening to this, they can go to rightleader.com and they'll see a link for the assessment and they'll be able to take it. I will tell you, fair warning up front, it's about three minutes long and you know, you'll know you instantly get a result. And when you get the result, you know, what it'll say, primary leadership style, you know, congratulations as fixer, congratulations, or whatever comes up being, there's gonna be one further question, which is, did we get it right? Mm, because okay. this is very much of a work in progress. We've only so far, done this test on about 500 people. Okay. And um, so, so we're working on it because there's a lot of things we believe that are not yet validated in the statistical sense. That makes a lot so of I'll sense. I'll give you an example. You as a fixer and builder, we think are linear styles. It mm. tends to be the leaders that are great fixers or builders tend to do one company at a time or one division. Artist and strategist, that's not possible. There's a very good reason, for example, with Elon, that he has to do Tesla, SpaceX, and Boring Company at the same time. He has to have that kind of distraction. Strategist leaders are, are the same in all walks of life. When Obama was president, he said, there are five 
crises demanding your attention every at every single point in time. You had to have that kind of distracted focus. That's an oxymoron, but artists and strategist styles need this parallel. That that makes a lot of sense. Absolutely makes a lot of sense. For me, give me give me the four walls and and here's the here's the people. This is what needs to be fixed. Got it. I got it. I, just leave me alone. I'll fix it. <laughs> you're right. So put it but this if you way. say, yeah. If you're exactly. an investor in a company and you you need a fixer and the person shows up and says, I'm the greatest fixer in the world, I'm also working on these two other companies fixing right now, run in the opposite direction. Do not hire uh, that person. Yes. Yes, I agree with you on that for sure. Absolutely, that makes a lot yeah. of sense. Well, this is this has been Robert. This has been fantastic. I think we've we've really just kind of you know scratched the surface of 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 this book, and I'm really going to encourage our listeners to to take a look at it and uh, just really understand where you fit in the spectrum. Uh, so, Robert, how can people find out more about you, uh, your company, and this new book? Thanks, John. I can be reached at interimexecs.com. Okay, great. And we'll put links to that. And, and we'll the book, also put it sorry, on the, the book is on all of the usual platforms and sites. Uh, you know, people can see that anywhere. Yeah. Outstanding. Well, we'll put a link to uh, your company, to the book, and then the rightleader.com once that's uh, out and ready so that they can get it and they can take the assessment and see where they stand. I think um, for me, very clearly, I definitely fit in the fixer category. And, uh, and I think that uh, it's nice that you you have this model, because I think it really helps us understand where we are, and what roles we should seek out to be able to fully utilize our skill sets and our experience and what really gets us like you said, in a flow state. And uh, so this has been uh, Robert, this has been fantastic. Thanks for coming on the show and sharing this new book and, and sharing your journey, your experiences and this new, uh, this new way to look at skill sets. Thanks, John. I'm honored.